The following episode of In Dispute Podcast contains material that could be upsetting to some listeners. Discretion is advised. And I'll now begin by introducing today's witnesses. The first witness is Dr. Anthony Levitino. Dr. Levitino is a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist. Over the course of his career, Dr. Levitino has practiced obstetrics and gynecology in both private and university settings, including as an associate professor of OBGYN at the Albany Medical College. And Dr. Levitino, we'll begin with you. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I only have five minutes, so I'm going to get right to it. Second trimester d and &E abortions performed between roughly 14 and 24 weeks of gestation. Your patient today is 17 years old. She's 22 weeks pregnant. Her baby is the length of your hand plus a couple of inches. And she's been feeling her baby kick for the last several weeks, but she's asleep on an operating room table. You walk into that operating room scrubbed and gowned, and after removing laminaria, you introduce a suction catheter into the uterus. This is a 14 French suction catheter. If she were 12 weeks pregnant or less, basically the width of your hand or smaller, you could basically do the entire procedure with this. But babies this big don't fit through catheters this size. After suctioning the amniotic fluid out from around the baby, you introduce an instrument called a sofa clamp. It's about 13 inches long. It's made of stainless steel. The business end of this clamp is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide. There are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. A d &E procedure is a blind abortion, so picture yourself introducing this and grabbing anything you can blindly and pull, and I do mean hard, and out pops a leg about that big, which you put down on the table next to you. Reach in again, pull again, and pull out an arm about the same length, which you put down on the table next to you, and use this instrument again and again to tear out the spine, the intestines, the heart and lungs. Head in the baby that size is about the size of a large plum, can't see it, but you have a pretty good idea you've got it if you've got your instrument around something and your fingers are spread about as far as they go. You know you did it right if you crush down on the instrument and white material runs out of the cervix. That was the baby's brains. Then you could pull out skull pieces. And you have a day like I had a lot of times, sometimes a little face comes back and stares back at you. Congratulations, you just successfully performed a second trimester d &E abortion. You just affirmed her right to choose. One more question, Dr. Levitino. Why did you end your practice of doing abortions? I did uh, over 1,200 abortions over a four-year period in private practice, not counting the ones that I did during my training. Um, I met my wife at, um, during my first year of training at Albany Medical Center. We got married about a year later and found that we had an infertility problem. After years of failed infertility treatment and several years trying to adopt a child, we were blessed with a, adopting a, a little girl that we named Heather. And, August of 1978. Um, as sometimes happens in those situations, my wife got pregnant the very next month, and we had two children 10 months apart. Um, two months short of my daughter Heather's sixth birthday, she was killed in an auto accident and literally died in her arms in the back of an ambulance. Anyone who has children might think they have some idea of what that feels like, but unless you've been through it yourself, you have no idea whatsoever. Um, I know people find it hard to believe, but uh, what do you do after disaster? You bury your child and then you go back to your life. And I don't remember exactly how long it was after my daughter died that I showed up at Albany Medical Center OR number nine to perform my first second trimester d &E abortion. I wasn't thinking of it as anything special. This was routine to me. Um, but I reached in, literally pulled out an arm or leg and got sick. You know, earlier on, I described stacking up body parts on the side of the table. It's not to, you know, gross people out, to use a simple term. When you do an, an abortion, you need to keep inventory. You have to make sure you get two arms and two legs and all the pieces. If you don't, your patient's going to come back infected, bleeding, or dead. Um, so I soldiered on and finished that abortion. And I know it sounds, as I said, hard for people to believe, but I'm, I'm telling you straight up my experience. You know, after over 1,200 abortions, first and second trimester up to 24 weeks and all the rest of it, and being very dedicated to it, for the first time in my life, I really looked. I really looked at that pile of body parts on the side of the table. And I didn't see her wonderful right to choose, and I didn't see all the money I just made. All I could see was somebody's son or daughter. And 
I stopped doing late-term abortions after that, and several months later stopped doing all abortions. Is still a question? Thank you. My name's Brandon Staub. And I'm Brad O'Connell. Welcome to In Dispute Podcast, where we discuss hot-button issues in the Christian church. We're learning to listen to the Bible instead of our emotions, and we invite you to learn with us. Our hope is that these raw conversations would help lead us to truth and bring us closer to the mind and heart of God. Hello, everybody. Welcome to In Dispute Podcast. Um, Tonight, or today, whenever you're listening to this, uh, we are going to be talking about, at least in this season, um, one of the two or three hardest topics of the season, and, and if we're being really honest, probably one of the hardest topics that we can foresee on this podcast. Um, it's a topic that is very serious, that's very divisive, but also one that needs to be talked about um, and fleshed out and argued about. Um, so the topic is abortion. Um but something I'm, I really want to just point out before we even get into the topic, before we get in any kind of conversation, before anybody shuts off the podcast just because of the topic, um, you, you know, as we have these conversations, we are well aware that our audience could be uh, from all kinds of different walks of life, whether that be re- religious people, uh, atheists, those in between, those seeking and different levels on each of those paths. But tonight, we, we or, or today, whenever you listen to this podcast, like I said, th- this topic is primarily uh, directed towards Christians. It's primarily directed towards those inside the church. If you are not one of those people, if you are not a Christian, if you are not a believer, please don't shut us off. We want, we want you to hear our, our thoughts on the topic. Uh, we would like you to on social media engage in the conversation ask questions um challenge us challenge our beliefs challenge the things that we that we think and say about this topic but my my most important thing that i wanted to point out here is that like i said this is towards the church this topic of ours as we discuss this is going to be focused on what christians should think and feel and believe and live like inside the realm of this topic if you are someone who is not a believer, not a Christian, um, I want you to focus in on what we're saying and try to understand where we're coming from, understand what we should look like as Christians, because we are well aware that the church often does not look like Jesus the way that it should. And I also want to point out that if you're listening, Christian or or not Christian, and you have experienced an abortion, Um, maybe you've had one, maybe you've been forced to have one by somebody that you were with, maybe you were in this predicament and and you are just covered in shame, covered in guilt, covered in questions, covered in pain. I want you to know right from the bat that this topic is not going to be one of condemnation. This is, this conversation is not going to be one filled with shame or ridicule. And I want you to know that from the bottom of our hearts that we are rooting for you um, to find grace that flows from the cross. And I want you to know, if you have not heard this passage, uh, John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Again, he did not come into the world to condemn it. He came to save it. I want you to know that you are not condemned by something that you have done but that Jesus and his gospel was meant to rid uh, us of shame, to save us, to grant us grace. Um, and then I also, as, as part of this this first part here, I want to share the story out of John 8 and kind of give you a picture, again, regardless of your belief system here, just give you a picture right off the bat of the kind of Jesus that we read of in the Bible because I think that it's good to see the God that we worship in the flesh before we even get into the topic. John 8 is a, is a story of a woman who was caught in adultery. Uh, we see that, that she was dragged by the Pharisees, by the, by the leaders, 
And I want you to use your imagination here a little bit because sometimes when we're just reading the surface of the text, it's really hard to understand what's going on here. But I want you to picture this crowd of men, this crowd of patriarchal men <laughs> um, taking a half-naked woman, probably extremely half-naked, maybe even fully naked, dragging her through the town in front of everybody through the dirt she's now probably scraped up she's definitely dirty she's probably filled with tears and fear and shame and all of the above and they throw her on the ground before jesus and they they tell jesus what she had done in front of the entire town so the entire town knows what she has done and that is that she was caught in the act of adultery and we see jesus kneel down and write in the dirt and, and people can guess but we have no clue what he was writing and then he questions the pharisees and he he asks them you know basically or he tells them if you have not sinned then cast the first stone and then we start seeing the men drop the stones and walk away now notice you know what this woman did here was considered one of the most shameful things that, that somebody could have done at this time period. She, by Mosaic law, should have been stoned to death, and so should the man that she was caught with. They should have been murdered in the street for this as punishment. And Jesus, in the midst of pain and shame and fear, stands up and looks the per this woman in the eye, right? Like, he actually grants her the grace and the dignity of looking her in the eyes. This woman that should have been murdered, he looks her in the eyes. And I want you to just picture the God of the universe grabbing her sweaty, tear-filled, probably swollen, probably just completely shame-filled face. And he looks at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Does no one accuse you anymore? Does no one condemn you? And she looks at him back in the eyes and says, no, no one's here. And he says, well, neither do I. So go and sin no more. And, and I want those of you listening to really picture and imagine and understand the intimacy of the God of the universe who came to not condemn but to save, picked this woman by her face, and pardon her of her, not just her sin, but her shame. And give her the freedom to walk away from that shame. Mm -hmm. We are often filled with shame because of lies that spawn from the enemy. Lies that spawn from the pit of hell. Lies that say, because you have done A, B, or C, you are not worthy to continue living. You're not worthy to be loved. You're not worthy to be forgiven. You're not worthy of God and of his image, and of his grace. But here we see that Jesus came to do the complete opposite. He came to say, no, 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 in the pit of hell, in the face of hell, in the face of all these lies, the truth is that I've come to free you. I've come to grant you the grace. I've come to grant you the love, the shamelessness that you've always desired, always needed. And so I look at that passage, and I think to myself, and I, and I, and I compare that passage to the world, and I compare that passage to the church, and I think, man, that, that's what we're supposed to look like, but that's not what we look like a lot of the times. And so I, I wanted to just start this conversation off with all that stuff because I think that kind of picture is really important before we get into it. this topic and similar topics to really see the heart of Jesus before we just starting start spitting off our opinions. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you have anything to add to that. I know that was kind of a lot, but I, I think that was kind of you know important to really start off a hard topic like this with understanding his heart. Yeah. I just I think it's also important to to note that <clears throat> Jesus Jesus had that conversation with her in the midst of the sin. Like mm -hmm. she was the scripture says caught in the act of adultery mm -hmm. that that doesn't mean that she was done committing the act and then she went and cleaned herself up and then she was caught right like she was in the act 
you know, we don't have to explain to you what that means. As Brad said, she was most likely naked. They probably pulled her off that situation and drug her to Jesus. And in the midst of the sin, he has that response. He didn't, um, he didn't, you know, pull her off to the side first and say, now, if you want to be saved from death here, I need you to uh, confess your sins first. I need you to clean up your act. I need you to say that you believe that I'm um, the Messiah. And I need you to say the sinner's prayer and ask me into your heart first. Mm -hmm. None of that occurred. He stepped in front of her as her advocate in the midst of her sin mm -hmm. and fought for her life. Right. Um, and some people might, might say, well, what does this story have to do with abortion? Um, you know, what does this story have to do with my situation maybe you had an abortion and you're saying well th this is something completely different what you know what she did is not nearly as as bad as what i did but you know what something brad said was that in that time period that law that act of adultery was punishable by death so in the eyes of the law um uh, the killing of a of an innocent child was also a, a sin punishable by death. So while there are two separate situations, the um, the penalty for both of those sins in that time were the same. Mm -hmm. The result would have been um, you're put to death. Um, you you kill a kid. Um, there, there's a we'll get we'll get to this later, but there is a passage in the Old Testament that talks about you know if if uh, a man hits a, a a woman in the stomach which causes a miscarriage, that that man is <clears throat> his sin is punishable by death. So the two sins, while they're not the same, they're both they both have equal um, re, uh, results of punishment. So it. You know, you're probably saying, well, that story has nothing to do with my situation of abortion, but it it, it, it really is very similar. And, you know, in the eyes of, of the Lord, in that time frame, they were both very severe mm -hmm. uh, sins that had very severe consequences. Um, so in that, in that um, respect, they are. You could look at them as the same situation. I think that had that woman been caught in the act of abortion in this story, uh, Jesus' response would have been exactly the same. Yeah, yeah I agree. Okay, so we'll move forward here. And heads up, this is a very big conversation. So this uh, this podcast topic will be split in two, at least. Um and so we'll do half of it for this episode, and we ask that you tune in for the next episode for the second half. Um, so where do we go from here? I think, yeah, I'd like I'd like to talk about the importance of human life first, because if we don't discuss that, then I, I think the rest of the topic's really not that important to talk about. Um, so in order for, in, in order for this topic to be anything worth spending time on then that means life itself needs to be something that's important to talk about it needs to be something that's important to us and needs to be something that's important to god and god starts off um sh really showing us how important life is to him and how important it is in general, what, what kind of a big of a, how big of a deal life is, right from the very beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. Right in Genesis 1, the first chapter of the entire Bible, God teaches us the bigness of life, the, the um, miraculousness, I guess, of life. 
It says in verses, so chapter 1, this is chapter 1, 26 and 27. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. So God created man, which is the word humankind. He created humankind in his own image. So that's important for two things, because one, it shows us that we are made in the likeness of the eternal God of the universe, the creator God, the king of all that is to be king over. We are in his likeness, in his image. So that's the first pretty big deal about that passage. But then the second part of that passage that's really cool, and that really shows the importance of human life specifically, is that it doesn't say that he made animals in his image. It said he made humankind in his image, which means we are a step above everything else on this planet. There's something different about humans. There's something special about humans that we don't see in the rest of the animal kingdom. And I think that's something to pay attention to and something to acknowledge uh, and think about, wrestle through when we're talking about this topic. I mean, animals, as far as we know, as far as we understand, animals aren't contemplating the philosophical debates of the universe, right? We don't see horses or dolphins wondering about the afterlife, what happens next, right? They worry about their next meal, they worry about somebody petting them or playing with them or cuddling with them or showing them affection, but we don't really see them that we know of. Their brains aren't connecting to the deeper things of the universe the way that a human would, right? Mm -hmm. At night after a long day or, you know, where I'm exhausted or where I've sinned against somebody I care about or sinned against God, I lay in bed and I ponder my decisions and I ponder how God could possibly forgive me and, and all that kind of stuff. What my life would be like if he didn't forgive me. But I don't see, I don't think animals are doing that kind of thing, right? So, so we're different. Our brains work different. We're, we're created in a more important way. Um, and, and we see that from a societal standpoint as well. Like, this isn't just a Bible argument here. This is like, if you're watching the Discovery Channel, I heard somebody say this before, I was, I was like, you know, that's, that's a pretty good idea there, a pretty good way to think about this concept of humans being important and different than the rest of the, the animals here. If you're watching the Discovery Channel and you see a lion go after a gazelle and just maul that thing, we're just like, all right, that's just the circle of life, right? Like, we can sing the Lion King song here. It's the you know, circle of life. Lions got to eat, right? But yet, we, you know, we have the movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Kind of, like, like, if I decide I'm just going to go kill some people and make chili out of them, like, I'm going to jail. You know what I mean? We are held to a totally different standard than the animal kingdom. There's some, Why is that? Why is it that the lion can kill a kill a gazelle but i can't kill somebody for food you know what i mean um why is it that if we see two male lions going after the throne and one kills the other one and becomes you know the king of the savannah we're like oh cool that's just part of life that's just what they need to do to survive and communicate and all this kind of stuff but if I am grocery shopping and some other man starts trouble with me in the parking lot and I deck him in the face to show him I'm, I'm in charge, I'm, I'm at minimum going to get a fine. Why? Because it's a human being. I can't just go over and assault a guy. Mm -hmm. right? But we wouldn't make that. We wouldn't call the cops if, we're, if we see a lion kill a lion. Like, 911 emergency. Would you, oh, I just saw a lion maul another lion. Like, they think you're crazy. Mm -hmm. now, I'm giggling a little bit, but I, I'm... I want to point out the importance of humanity. I want to point out the the importance of the human life in the eyes of the Creator God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and to that and to that point, if I can jump in while you're on creation, um, I mean, you can just see reading through Genesis and the creation account the difference in how God is creating the earth and the, the plants and the water and the animals by just speaking them out into existence. Mm -hmm. 
yet the importance of humanity as we see God forming man from the dust of the earth. So it's not it's not God from a distance speaking man into existence, but it's actually God getting down into the dirt, getting dirty to creatively form man with his own hands. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, is is approximate God when it comes to creating the earth and everything in it, but he's an intimate God when it comes to creating uh, man, mankind, um, because there's he, he places so much more importance and value in the life of a human being um, than he does anything else. And, and we see that right from the very beginning of Scripture um, with God, once he builds Adam, gets into literally his face <laughs> close enough to uh, the scriptures as breathed into Adam's nostrils. And I don't know if anyone of you have ever breathed in anybody else's nostrils. Um, but you have to be really, really close to someone to, to be able to breathe into their nostrils. And that's, the, that's how intimate God wanted to be with uh, man. Mm -hmm. It's how special um, mankind was to God. I mean, you didn't see God breathing life into the nostrils of the lion right. or the lamb. Um, but you do see that with uh, the, the human beings. Right. Um, and so. He could have. He could have done it that way. He could have taken the animals out of the dirt and made them that way. Mm -hmm. Or he could have spoken man into existence, but mm -hmm. he didn't. There was something different about them. There was something more important about them. Right. And I, and I believe that that intimacy is connected very strongly to what it means to have the image of God. Um, so, it's important to understand in this topic why we care. Why we want to talk about this topic. Because like I said, a couple minutes ago, if life is not important, if if we are, as, as some people believe, if we are only animals, if we are not special, if we are if we are just monkeys with a better brain, um, then then we're not worth saving. We're, we're not worth having this conversation over because we're we're merely part of the animal kingdom. And if we die, then we die. If we kill each other, then we kill each other. It's survival of the fittest. There's no reason to have this talk or any talk around morality, um, and and morality would be good for nothing except for the survival of our specific species for a certain amount of time. But we see that the Bible says the complete opposite, that we are worth something, that we are special, and that we are worth fighting for, um, and that's what makes this conversation important to have. Mm -hmm. In Jeremiah 29, 11, everybody in the church world, probably people outside the church world, know that that passage you know I, for i know the plans i have for you plans to prosper you and to give you a hope and a future and not to harm you um it, in jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 which we'll get we'll hit on this later too it says before i formed you in the womb i knew you before you were born i set you apart i appointed you as a prophet to the nations so like there we see even god bef telling jeremiah like before you were even born, I had this grand plan for your life to be um, a, a, a prophet to the nations. Mm -hmm. um, I think we hear this verse a lot, but we that I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, we kind of keep out of the, the verse. But I think it's so important that we see that because God placed that important task on Jeremiah before he was even uh, formed in the womb. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, God just has, him, it, it's not just Jeremiah, it's all of us. God has this grand and imp important plan uh, set for every single person um, before we're even born. Right. Like he's, not, he's not careless about cr the creation of humanity. He's not careless about the artwork that human beings are and you know, the masterpiece that we are for him. 
Um, he's very meticulous about it to the point where before we're even thought of that he's already he already has our days planned out, you know, and his hope is that we would choose that plan, obviously. Um, but yeah, he, he's just he's not careless. He's not just throwing a bunch of bones inside some skin and saying good luck. But he's planning this out. He's he's God is as intimate with you and I and the person thirty years from now as he was with Adam mm -hmm. when it comes to the creation of our lives. Yeah. So now that you mentioned that passage, it might be a good time to move on to the part of the discussion about where we think life begins as far as um, f from our view as, a, as Christians, uh, w where we personally believe life begins um, and where we believe the Bible says that life begins. Because again, like, like this last point, it, this is important for us to understand and have a stance on because depending on when we believe life begins, then again, this topic might not be important or needed to have at all. But uh, it could be the complete opposite. It could be that our belief warrants, demands this conversation to have, right. um, to be had, which is what I believe, which what you believe. Um, and, and and just so that it's said, there are, I mean, there are even Christians who would say that life doesn't begin until um, the actual birth of a baby. Mm -hmm. um, so this is this is where we're going to be taking this discussion. From this point is um, from a biblical standpoint. What does the Bible say? Or when does the Bible say that life actually does begin? Right. Um, is it at birth or is it before that? So um, let's see what the Bible Bible has to say about it. And, and again, probably probably from this point on, we're really focusing our attention on the church. Um, and so again, if, if you're finding yourself to be a skeptic or you're not a believer, uh, we ask that you would hear our thoughts, that you would engage with our conversation via social media. But please know that this conversation, we are well aware, I'll say that we, we are well aware that if you are not a believer, that, that you most likely disagree with this stuff. We, we understand that. Um, we're, we're not trying to argue with you at this point in time. This is to our brothers and sisters inside the church who we believe, according to the word of God, should have this stance. So I think that's important to, to press on with. Mm -hmm. But so you just mentioned if you want to reread that passage, it kind of gives really the biblical standpoint of when life begins. Yeah, Jeremiah 1, chap uh, chapter 1, verse 5 uh, says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. It's God speaking to Jeremiah. Two, two passages that are very similar to that are in the Psalms. Psalm 139, verse 13, very similar. It says, For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. So really that passage has kind of got two prongs to it. One, it backs up our last point, the importance of human life we see that god is intimate inside the womb right knitting us together we see t this image of a god whose hands are involved in the actual creation he he chooses for some reason we can't understand to not say let there be brandon <laughs> right let there be brad but he's intimately knitting us together but then it also points out that th this creation this importance this uh essence of humanity uh, of life begins inside the womb that according to god life and the worth of life doesn't start outside the womb but it actually starts inside the womb right and you know we are not stupid people we know how babies are born right like so we know that god's not actually the holy spirit's not inside your mother's womb with a pair of knitting needles like we get that but what this passage is saying is that beneath the biology 
that God is at work. Like beneath the science, God is doing something inside the womb that makes this thing life and that makes it important. I think it's also, if I can jump yeah. in quick, um, I used to think, oh, well, like what was so special about Adam that he, he gets this special treatment where God... He's the only one that God, you know, gets down there and actually storms with his hands. Mm -hmm. And he gets that intimate uh, moment with God. But really what we're reading here is that it's almost as if God is, is still involved intimately with the forming of the human being. Yeah. It's just um, now it's in the womb of, of mom and not from the dust of the earth right god is still as you said intimately part of the the growth and the creation within the womb mm -hmm. yeah um, another passage that i like as far as this this part of the conversation is psalm 51 in the fifth the fifth verse it says indeed i was guilty when i was born but then it says, I was sinful when my mother conceived me. So what that is, what that is telling us, the psalmist is saying that at the point of conception, I was covered in original sin. But at the point of inception, before I could take a breath, before I was more than a sperm and an egg cell meeting, or, or at that point, I should say, I was considered unworthy of your holiness, of your righteousness. At, at that point of conception, I was considered a sinner, right? Which means that the Bible is telling us that there is something of essence, there, there is an essence, a soul, you might say, at conception. There's something that is worthy or unworthy of eternal life. At the point of conception, according to Psalm 51, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, that's pretty crazy. And what's even cooler about that is, regardless of the topic, my favorite thing about the Bible and science, like, I'm, I'm not one of those Christians that thinks, like, science is a bunch of wish-wash and, no, you gotta, you gotta follow the Bible and only the Bible. Like, in so many cases, they're best friends. Mm -hmm. In so many cases, it's like you read this scientific fact, you're like, oh, man, that's really awesome. The Bible said it a couple thousand years beforehand, but that's really cool that we're now scientifically able to prove it, mm -hmm. right? And so Psalm 51 verse 5 said, indeed, I was guilty before I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me, right? So I was something when my mother conceived me. And we know from a, sci a scientific standpoint, and this is from 2017, right? So this isn't a long time ago. This is two years ago from the American College of Pediatricians. The predominance of human biological research confirms that human life begins at conception, fertilization. At fertilization, the human being emerges as a whole, genetically distinct, individuated, zygotic, living human organism. A member of the species Homo sapien needing only the proper environment in order to grow and develop. So I'm not going to reread that whole paragraph, but basically it's saying at fertilization, at conception, that that which comes out of that is considered a human organism. It is, it is scientifically considered part of the species Homo sapiens. The only thing that it would need to flourish from that point is the right environment. But the essence of life, the essence of humanity is there. The difference between the individual in its adult stage and in its zygotic stage is one of form, not nature. That's so powerful. And yet, thousands of years before that, we have Psalm 51 saying, I had an essence, I had a nature of life at conception. Mm -hmm. And then we're confirming that in, you know, in this article from 2017. Um, and then if, you know, if I could take it a little bit further, you know, we're saying this human organism, human organism, 
an organism is defined as one, a complex structure of interdependent and subordinate elements whose relations and properties are largely determined by their function in the whole, and two, an individual constituted to carry on the activities of life by means of organs separate in function but mutually dependent, a living being, right? So here we have the American College Pediatrician saying that at fertilization we have a human organism, and then we have a definition of organism, and that is, in essence, a living being. It is clear from the time of cell fusion, the embryo consists of elements from both maternal and paternal origin, which function interdependently in a coordinated manner to carry on the function of the development of the human organism. So the single-celled embryo that, can, that comes out of fertilization is not just a cell, but it's an actual organism, a human being, by the definition of the word organism. Um, so there we, there we have science and the Bible meeting face to face as friends, mm -hmm. describing really the beginning of life. Yeah, uh, and I mentioned a, a, a verse earlier on in Exodus, it's in Exodus 21, 22 through 24. So that if, if men flight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely yet no harm follows he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman uh, as the woman's husband imposes on him he shall pay as the judges determine but if any harm follows then you shall give life for life eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot so basically this is describing the there is an, a person inside of this woman's body that um, has been harmed by um, this man. There was a fight. Fists are flying. A uh, woman gets hit in the stomach hard enough um, to cause uh, the death of the child in her belly. Um, God sees that as punishable by death. Um, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, life for life. Um, mm -hmm. Life in the stomach um, of the of the woman. The, the life of the man for the life of the child. God views the, the uh, person on the inside of the womb as a person, as a life, um, as an important part of creation, his creation, that, that knitting together in the mother's womb, he uh, sees that as important enough in the Old Testament here, in this Old Testament law, that if anybody harms that life that has not been born yet, then that's punishable by death. Which is the t really the, the total opposite of, of the essence of our culture today, in a sense, which is why we're having this conversation, is we look at the argument of abortion today, and, and it largely consists of whether or not what is inside the mother's womb is considered the same or different than what's outside the womb. But here in scripture, we see that not only is God telling us this, we have to remember like the Bible is written in, in large chunks of the Bible are, is written as a historical document as, as a journal entry. Right. And so this isn't just God saying that they're the same inside and outside, but the society around it, them accepted that as well. Um, that you know that there really is like you just point out there is no difference what it's kind of like this the scientific <laughs> article that i just quoted from the difference is one of form not of nature right it might look different feel different weigh a different weight um 
get its nutrients in a different way, but the essence of it is not different, whether it's inside or outside the mother's womb. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a pretty pretty powerful passage. Yeah. Um, um, where do I want to go? I just want to mention also that in in Matthew and even in Luke, when it's giving the account of um, Mary being immaculate, the immaculate conception of Jesus. Um, once that, once the people found out of the conception of Jesus, there was joyous celebration because they were celebrating the arrival of the Messiah, mm -hmm. even though he had not been born yet. Even just from the word of his conception, people were just in celebration. Um, right. And even um, Mary went to uh, visit Elizabeth, yeah. Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother. And uh, the scripture says that uh, when Mary got into the presence of uh, Elizabeth, that even John the Baptist leapt inside his mother's womb, being in the presence of the Savior, mm -hmm. who had just been conceived probably not even five days before. So it's like five days of being pregnant, which at that point is, is still probably just a mass of cells that may be just beginning to form. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that kind of a reaction, not only from the people who now know that the Messiah is here, but um, that kind of a reaction um, from another pregnancy um, with John the Baptist leaping, almost almost in joy, mm -hmm. leaping, um, being in the presence of Jesus. Yeah. Um, but, you know, some some other scientific... Um, fact here, and I'll just read the quote. It says, from at least uh, 1968 to present day, medical textbooks and scientists have been explaining that there is a specific undefinable moment when every human being begins to exist, the moment of conception. The child's heartbeat soon follows, 22 days later, and possibly as early as 16 days later. Uh, brain waves can be measured at six weeks, um, and in the first trimester of pregnancy, the human baby uh, learns to yawn, kick, curl, curl the body, um, and suck on their thumb. Um, they develop unique fingerprints. Um, they're capable of attempting to swim away from abortion instruments. Um, the, after the first trimester, the human baby will have all the uh, major organs, uh, systems in place. Um, they just need time to uh, develop through nutrition and grow. Um, Other, I'm, I don't, I'm a little, you have to check my, check me on some of this stuff, but like in eight weeks, do you see some reflexes starting? Um, there, there's even a study where they did uh, some tests on reflexes where I think it's called like the pullback reflex, mm -hmm. where like if you would take your hand and you would swiftly move it towards your face your reflex would pull back before you smack yourself in the eye to keep yourself from injuring yourself. There's like this natural reflex to, to pull back before you hit your own body. And they've actually seen that development in the womb mm -hmm. where, you know, babies in the womb are moving their limbs around, but they see a pullback reflex as they're approaching, smacking themselves in the face or in the eyes. Um, so even their like instinctual reflexes are developing in the womb. 
Um, that's a proven scientific fact that that, that happens. It, there's also, um, and this comes from a uh, basically Journal of Neonatal Medicine, 2013. There's some science out there that shows that as young as eight weeks, so, some studies show seven weeks, some show just after eight weeks, um, that, it, that, that the eight-week-old baby can sense and feel things that, that would force it to um, have, have a, a reflex, kind of like what you were just saying, during invasive procedures. And so we're not talking just about an abortion as far as the procedure goes, but any type of um, invasive surgery that might need to go on while, while a woman might be pregnant. I mean, like there's you know, some bigger hospitals, more advanced hospitals have teams that are doing these invasive surgeries on, on fetuses, on babies um, in the womb, depending on the different stages of life. Uh, would you know depend on what kind of invasive procedure you can do but this you know th there are studies out there that show that you know even at this young of an age that um, that there's some sort of reflex showing feeling right so you know different people might define pain in a different way but either way you're touching this baby's foot for example and it will recoil the, the foot or the leg, or it'll arch its back or something like that, showing that the brain and the flesh are connecting, right? That, that it can feel what's happening. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a pretty big thing. Um, there's actually, uh, again, these are all coming from medical journals and we can put this stuff out there on social media if anybody has questions where we're getting these, these facts from. But uh, there's some pretty extensive evidence of a, hormon a hormonal stress response by unborn babies as early as 18 weeks. Um, so 18 weeks is a little bit later on, obviously, than the eight-week mark that I was just talking about. But that's still pretty young um, and pretty early on in the process. And even at that time, they're noticing that, that babies have this hormonal thing going on, that, you know, a reaction to stress inside the womb, right? So as little as seven or eight weeks, they can feel some sort of pain, or at least they have some sort of feeling that would cause their body to recoil when you touch it, um, which shows that their brain's working um, and their nerve endings are working. And then at 18 weeks, they're able to actually um, respond to stress by releasing you know, certain hormones, which is pretty, again, it's pretty crazy because these, these are fairly early on stages of life where, you know, some... Some women aren't finding out that they're even pregnant until they're closer to, you know, six or seven weeks. It doesn't give a whole lot of time to make a decision before the child can scientifically start to feel things, right? Um, so, the, so you know, I, I just kind of find, cause clearly I'm not able to get pregnant, but my wife can. And so I remember when we had our two boys, um, you know, learning about some different things about the fetus, the size, and, you know, you, you know all this kind of stuff going on inside. It's just, it's just really crazy what science knows today um, about this life that's growing inside of the woman. And, and here's, another, here's another thing that honestly kind of blew me away, is not, not only... The, do we have studies that say that babies are recoiling at, at these young ages? Um, but fetal surgeons, and um, and this is a, this is a newer piece of information, 2017 from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. No, I'm sorry. That was the that that was the stuff that I was just talking about about the uh, extensive the hormonal stress was that, um, but. Here's some information. Fetal surgeons recognize unborn babies as patients to the degree that a leading children's hospital. Oh, no, this is the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. I'm sorry. Uh, Philadelphia. A leading children's hospital performed nearly 1,600 fetal surgeries, right? So we're talking surgeries. We're not talking abortions. 
between 1995 and June of 2017. Perinatal medicine now treats unborn babies as young as 18 weeks for dozens of conditions. Pain medicine for unborn patients is routinely administered as standard medical practice. So we have these babies inside the womb at 18 weeks old. And when surgeries are done, invasive surgeries are done, that they're considered patients, number one, by a hospital's largest, the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. But then this team of surgeons is actually injecting some sort of pain medicine th through the, the um, however, however they would invasively do that in the mom, and, and giving the baby pain medicine at as young as 18 weeks old. Because they know scientifically that even inside the womb at that young, that they could feel pain. That it hurts them to have this procedure done. Um, and so they're, they're numbing it basically like you would a human outside the womb before a big surgery. Hmm. And, and honestly, before doing a research for this the topic, I had no idea that, that that was going on. I just find that to be pretty, pretty crazy, pretty eye opening. Yeah. I, I'm, for me, and I, this is not in my notes. This is just something that came to me as we were, we were talking. And um, I don't want to sound like insensitive or anything to, to anyone who may have had an abortion. But I think one of the most compelling scientific proofs of... Um, The unborn child being a person is the just the, the fact that there have been children aborted that have actually survived. We have living, breathing, walking around human beings that have been aborted and thrown in dumpsters and um, have survived that to tell their story. Um, I mean, if that's not proof enough that what is growing inside of a woman's womb is a human being, and then I don't know what more um, you could ask for than someone who has been aborted and um, is now a, 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 an adult or a, a, a living, breathing person walking around life. Um, so amazing that a baby could could survive something like that. Um, that to me is 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 <laughs> proof enough. I mean, all the all the proof and, and scientific evidence that that we brought tonight to the to the table was amazing. And that the last thing I had never heard of anything like that. That's amazing. Um, but I just think it's amazing that, again, that God values life so much that he has been able to spare the life of aborted babies, um, so that they can actually continue their, to live the life that he had planned for them. Mm -hmm. That's pretty crazy. Well, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I think this is a good place to stop for this week. Um, and then we'll pick up again next week with um, talking about how we as Christians should be handling the, the, the topic, how we should be handling... Um, women who are dealing or thinking about having an abortion um, should we be picketing should we be outside of Planned Parenthood screaming bloody murder um, at, at people is that really how we should be handling um, this situation mm -hmm. um, 
also we want to talk about what we as the church, what we as Christians can do to provide alternatives uh, for women who think they don't have any options. Right. How can we pr be proactively serving people that feel like they're out on the margin? Right. And um, also want to hit on just briefly uh, what it means to be pro-life and not just anti-abortion. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, that, that's some stuff that we're going to be hitting on next week. So bring your cup of coffee because it, it might actually be a slightly longer episode because we'd also like to take time out of not only out of fairness but but out of education for ourselves take some time to discuss a few of the arguments of of the pro-choice side that would be against Christianity in our viewpoint and try to wrestle through those arguments um, and if we're being transparent some of those arguments we're also confused about as well mm -hmm. um, and are also praying over and also scratching our head a little bit mm -hmm. um, but we want to be fair, we want to be open, and we want to be able to have those those discussions, um, you know, as, as well as part of this talk on abortion, so. Yeah. yeah. I think that we want to make sure that people who are listening to this know that it's not us versus the world. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's, we're trying to be as much like Jesus as we possibly can here it's um not no condemnation to the world where we're here to try to understand where people are coming from um have that dialogue and try to uh, you know we we want to we want to love people um like jesus loved people so uh Next week, join us for the second half of the discussion on abortion, and we'll see you then. Thanks for listening to In Dispute Podcast. We hope today's conversation has stirred you to seek biblical truth. If you'd like to contact us with questions, comments, or suggest topics, you can find us on Twitter at Dispute Podcast and on Facebook at facebook.com slash indisputepodcast. Tune in next week for another topic in dispute.